welcome to On Helix. Nice to be back face to face. Since first time since what, 2019? Seems like an age ago. So, you know, it can be a long thing's happened in three years and see what we see this morning. A lot happens in about three minutes when you watch the TV news feed. Um, but I think all of that, the great success stories that are happening is down, you need great leadership at all sorts of levels. And we know that can be lacking and things go off the rails. But actually, on that note, it's my pleasure to introduce our, introduce our, our opening speaker, Melanie Lee, because I think you've got the, the profile in front of Melanie, but I think what rings out from that, both from the charity sector and, and industry, large and small, is the fact that Melanie is one of those great leaders that helps us deliver what we do in the sector. So, Melanie, over to you. inviting me to speak with you today. And I think the main message today is going to be about let's just no barriers across sector collaboration. And uh, just to introduce my part to you and, and tell you how we're going to do our best to, to achieve the very best we can for patients in a way that's somewhat novel when it comes to um, uh, how industry is constrained by its own business models, but we hope to open doors to particularly make sure that the patient and everybody involved in healthcare, all of us, one day will be patient, are involved in the future of healthcare delivery. So um, I'm just going to talk about bioinnovation for health because I had to look up the definition of bioinnovation and um, it was interesting to me to find that the uh, World Economic Forum definition is actually something that we've seen living in our very recent times in that it's the combination of biotechnology, innovation around governance and the rules of engagement. Now that's quite interesting because it does open borders and it does actually speak to something we saw during the pandemic, which is true uh, innovation coming from any technical discipline combined with uh, governance and a, a whole range of stakeholders and economies working together. So I found that interesting. I think, yes, that's definitely the future. And so uh, with that in mind, uh, and that's a, that's a definition that was described uh, by Richard Hammond of Cambridge Consultants when he was being um, interviewed by Richard Leyland. So let's just go to um, what bioinnovation opportunities are here. So we've got uh, cross-disciplinary convergence, um, and it's a driver of, of an extraordinary era of possibility and biomedical progress. And obviously, engineers, digital data scientists are all working together with the traditional sort of biologists and chemists to understand uh, how to deepen our knowledge of disease. And they're developing more and more powerful tools to probe and perturb biology in more predictable ways, turning drug discovery into more of an engineering science and less a game of trial and error. And this is really important to attract the industries that will provide us with the products ultimately into the space. So obviously we've got genomics, that's a revolution. We know that um, we've got notably cell and gene therapies on the horizon helping us now and helping our patients. Um, we've also got a pipeline of antibodies, small, um, small molecules, proteins, and, and ever a new modalities. And we see stunning innovation coming in from other sectors, such as from um, the environmental research sector, where we see, for example, programmable programmable bacteria that can digest uh, plastics. So, you know, who knows what possibilities there are if we actually open our doors in healthcare to these types of industry and technology and research. Digital therapeutics have also arrived, helping patients diagnose and manage and treat their condition. And they have a very powerful impact on patients' behaviour, recovery, and all together across their journey. So let's not underestimate that um, therapeutics don't have to be only the traditional um, products, the modalities we're used to. And LifeArc is obviously a supporter of the Francis Crick Institute's KQ Labs digital accelerator, and we support early startups working on digital and data-powered health solutions. Now, you've heard so much about this, the COVID era, and I know, um, you know, we all get sort of tired of it, but I actually uh, went to a conference sponsored by AZ, but at the Royal Society. And for the first time, I actually saw real outcomes of the work that was put in 
during the pandemic through the collaboration. And I think rather than dwell on this today, I just urge you to realize that that truly, truly was a revolution in collaboration and it swept aside bureaucracy and traditional hurdles. I fear that we might go back a little bit to that bureaucracy and the traditional hurdles, maybe for necessity when we really are in unknown territory, we have to be super cautious. But at the same time, let's advance and disrupt our traditional processes by being very open to bringing in new technologies and new ideas. And for this, it, this, this particular um, COVID pandemic, LifeArc put £27 million directly into clinical studies, repurposing um, opportunities and generally to support post-pandemic or, or this era, if you like, um, opportunities to continue drug discovery in antiviral research and early warning systems for pan future pandemics. Something I'm very interested in as well is um, that we, we previously, um, you see people referencing robust diagnosis using technology and not clinical parameters. This is a really important point. We're seeing now that technology is a far, far better diagnostic of subphenotypes of disease than clinical parameters. Clinical parameters can be very confusing, they can be very similar with different basal causes of disease. And these are just two examples here on this slide where subphenotypes of disease can be identified through, for example, imaging in the case of the um, uh, Alzheimer's diagnostic or um, EEGs in the case of the um, motor neurone disease diagnostic. And these are very robust diagnoses. And in the case of the new um, ALS paper that you see on the, on the left there, um, on your right, uh, the the four, four subphenotypes that are identified of ALS, which absolutely has to start to be diagnosed early, those are really robust subphenotypes that you cannot dis describe clinically. So I think that's very powerful. So I think technologies are showing themselves to be possible, possibly replacing um, clinical diagnostic tools. And hopefully, and from, in my view, they're actually really giving hope to patients that uh, before they get their clinical diagnosis, we can actually understand propensity for disease and maybe get into the eras of, of prevention and cure, rather than, as you'll see, with, with supporting MND, um, waiting till patients show symptoms and then know they've got a death sentence of 12 to 18 months. And of course, there are now several approved digital therapeutics for mental health disorders like anxiety, sleep and substance abuse. And the ability to access these anytime, anywhere is another dimension in our lives that's truly, truly helpful when you're dealing with mental illness. So the convergence is really exciting. It's changing how we diagnose diseases and how we discover and develop medicines. And it's also empowering us all as patients. So interdisciplinary innovation, let's look here. Our, our innovation base broadens to include a wider range of experts. And as we delve deeper into the intricacies of human biology, connections become even more important. And there are more potential partners, more ideas to fund and support, and more work to do to ensure that great ideas translate into solutions for patients. And many of the, um, the, the sort of solutions for patients will come from outside our sector, and these are some examples. And as I said before, they're not all drugs. So voice technology, as you see on the screen, is a good example of a solution in one domain that finds an important output in another. And technologists have developed software that can mimic voices um, with extraordinary accuracy and for our human ear, familiarity. So this technology, at the end of June, that Amazon launched, uh, was to uh, have the Alexa devices able to mimic um, everybody's voice, uh, including those of your dead relatives. And your dead mother, can, grandmother, can now read to you at bedtime and speak to the family forevermore. And voice technology is really being able to help patients, which I think is really important. When you look at motor neurone disease, again, one of the areas we support, which I'll come back to, 
Voice goes very early in the process, soon after diagnosis. In fact, it can be one of the indicators that you have the disease. And the importance of getting on keeping your voice through the progress of the disease is unbelievable. And if you look at um, this website, the, well, it's a YouTube video, if you look up I Will Always Be Me, you will see the first ebook that banks your voice has been launched. And what's really interesting to me is it was derived through a collaboration, as you see here, between Dell, Intel, Rolls-Royce, and the MND Association. So where's the life sciences sector in that? And what it's done for patients is that you have to look at that video to see what it's done for patients. And these are not old patients, these are young and old patients across all diversities. So um, I Will Always Be Me has been given to 750 people in the UK and the aim is to roll it out globally. Obviously rolling things out globally is quite complex as you cross geographic and language barriers, but that's the, that's the intention. And if you, it makes sense that the computer and car industry are really at the leading edge of voice recognition technology. So, you know, let's us be bold in our thinking about how we can help patients. So LifeArc is uh, really, we're early translation specialists. We come from our roots at Medical Research Council Technology, so we build on 28 years of understanding translation. We're now self-funded and we're rebranded as LifeArc <coughs> as we actually monetize the royalty stream and we have £1.3 billion pounds to spend by 20, 2030 to actually really boost the translation community, especially within the UK, but we will work on the global stage in some of our translational challenges that I will describe. We recognise that the language of translation is entirely different than the language of basic research. And um, that this country has a, an astounding research base, but we do actually lose a lot of things uh, that never actually escape from the lab because we're not there to support and really help the academics. And they themselves, the very structure of their living and their funding is not traditionally about translation. Although increasingly quinquennial review panels are coming back to these research environments are saying where's your translation so we're uniquely able to help and we want to work with um, entrepreneurs and scientists on a bench to bedside journey so last night last month we announced two um, great examples of our um, collaboration. The first was we've committed £30 million over five years to the UK Dementia Research Institute. So that's largely funded by the MRC, but also a couple of other charities. And it's to help them translate their discoveries into uh, the underlying mechanisms of neurodegenerative disease into solutions for patients, new tests, new treatments, new devices. And dementia is a really urgent societal problem. It affects 900 thousand people in this country today and it will likely impact 1.6 million of us by 2040. The second initiative that we announced was a 4.2 million pound grant for research into other neurodegenerative condition motor neurone disease and the funds are committed alongside the MND association um, and the and, and my name's Doddy, uh, the MRC and the National Institute for Her Health and Care Research. And they support a new MND partnership with experts from six UK universities aiming to discover new treatments for this devastating disease. And I, again, the real em emphasis there um, is to make sure that we catch people early. So we are looking at disease monitoring, we're looking at patient registers and improved models and robust diagnosis of disease. And we think that will attract in um, the, the therapeutics experts because they will actually know they're dealing with a very robust and stable uh, patient population as they start to work in, with them in the clinic. So if you look at um, LifeArc's overall uh, mantra it's about partnership we are if we're early translation how on earth can we make a difference uh, all the way through and we're very conscious that we have to make a difference all the way through so if we're in a, a project which actually is, is an antibody or biologics project and we need to deliver to a third world country a product we can't ignore formulation and thermostable proteins etc so we are we're actually committed not just within um, the area that we've traditionally worked 
but with partners all the way through. So we've got three strategic pillars. They're called impact with partners, which is philanthropic giving. Uh, we've got a um, we've got a philanthropic panel who help us give grant funding to scientists when their research needs to be moved that little bit further to decide on its real potential. We've got. Um, 120 scientists in the organization diagnostic and therapeutic scientists and we're we're readdressing our platforms to actually offer services to and support um, others uh, in externally whose work we're progressing and then we've got an early ventures team who have money to deploy they're quite well established now have a good pipeline we put five million into each of the early companies and we take risk much earlier than maybe the traditional even the seed funds do but we also have have follow-on funding available and we've just had a new CFO join us and he, uh, we will be um, delivering a broader strategy for, for further funding. So we, we're very excited to be in the UK. The UK punches above its weight in the sciences and we think life has got to be there to support um, that whole area. We're not engineers, we're not data scientists, although we will be building data science and we're not digital experts, but we will work with and, and we will form through our translational challenges that a mega project, as I'm going to tell you about in just a second. So looks, let's look at what a translational challenge is. Well, a translational challenge is a, a, a big project that has multiple projects around it that will discuss uh, a pa central patient issue. So take motor neurone disease, for example. And we know if we look at diagnosis, what's the unmet need? We look at devices, how will we help patients on their journey? We look at drugs, where and what will it take to actually understand the disease sufficiently to get those therapies to patients? And who do we need to work with to do it? What policy changes do we need? What charitable organisations can we work with to help patients now and today? And how do we empower the patients to know very early on whether they're at risk and really understand if there's a familial issue, if there is um, a, on a genetic basis of disease, if there is um, some other metabolic issue, if there's a way to prevent this disease happening. So this is um, these are complex uh, healthcare challenges that are multifaceted and when you have we'll hope to have six of these running by 2023 we will launch three this year and the three um, each one can spend up to around 100 million pounds um, in any facet of our strategy and our tools for delivery. So these are the three that we will launch this year. I mentioned motor neurone disease, and we're going to have challenge leaders internally. So these have started internally. And we've got Paul Wright leading the motor neurone disease. He's a passionate advocate for um, making lives of MND patients better and solving some of these intractable problems. And it's probably too small an indication at this moment to be on, on the radar of the bigger companies, but we also believe it needs this multifaceted approach to sort of really find some very innovative solutions. And I will always be me as, of course, really helping that population. Uh, another area, chronic respiratory infection, that is um, for patients who are um, cystic fibrosis and non-cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis patients. Their lives are miserable due to exacerbations that they can't predict, and it's completely disruptive to their world. So again, this area is one that we're very passionate about. And then global health infections goes into um, emerging viral threats, neglected tropical diseases, and um, um, uh, antibiotic resistance, multiple antibiotic resistance. So of course that's multifaceted. We will break that down into doable chunks and that will be launched uh, the latest of the three. So we have the first two more early this year. So come and talk to us if you're interested. Each is fully supported by an expert scientific advisory panel um, because we really understand in life art we're technologists, not disease experts. But these people in these translational challenges will become experts in all facets of the disease ultimately with the help of an external team. So our challenges are indeed really ambitious. Um, our Strategic Advisory Council, it's another group of advisors, not our trustees themselves, but some very creative and diverse group of people. They're helping us um, to be sufficiently bold and to think big about the problems that we're trying to solve and be fully creative about the solutions that um, take us all the way from basic research and understanding of disease right through to delivering something to the patients. 
And this necessarily, it absolutely requires us to think outside of our comfort zone, face up to and disallow barriers to progress all the way. So we can't turn a blind eye to a formulation problem if that's going to actually be the classic place that nothing gets to Africa because of a formulation problem and it's not thermostable. So let's work with, um, in our, and then we've decided we'll focus in our translational challenge aims because otherwise you become completely defocused and you don't really deliver. So partnerships and collaborations are truly essential to tap into the best specialists and experts across processes uh, required to develop solutions across the four Ds, that's diagnostics, devices, digital technologies and drugs, and maybe many more things that we haven't yet thought about. So if you want to know more and you want to subscribe to our newsletter, please do so. Um, I don't know if you can see the, um, can you, I can't see it from here. Can you see a, a code up there? Yeah. No? Okay, well, I'll give you the code. I, that, that slide seems to have been corrupted. So thank you for listening, and please spread the word that LifeArc is here to support bioinnovation and find novel solutions to improve patient diagnosis, rapidly decide on the course of disease and available treatments, and draw therapeutic companies into the early space to realize the potential of advanced therapies for prevention and cure. Patients are ready to be connected between themselves and into the broader healthcare environment and have um, and, and they want to be informed and to decide how to participate in their futures. We're all in that bucket if we really think about it. And we've shown the world that the population at large is quick to adopt new technologies, has a more sophisticated understanding of disease than we had thought in the past. We must keep educating them and involving them and embracing the broadest technologies to improve patient lives and healthcare outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, some roving mics. If you've got questions, do take this off now and, and the mic will come to you. Um, just in case there's time to get there, because the last fellow that you mentioned in that collaboration about ways life science, yeah, so you look at uh, engineering, big data. When we're trying to attract the best talent, does life sciences become an outdated? <laughs> Yeah, I think it might does do. Does it become limited? Yeah. I think life sciences does become limiting because I think if you're a, if you're a voice engineer at Rolls-Royce, you probably wouldn't consider yourself able to contribute to life sciences. I think we can be quite... Um, the, the, certainly, certainly the academic system in the UK is quite siloed and hopefully they're opening their borders more now. But the, um, the translation space can't afford to be siloed. We have to be open to innovation from everywhere. And maybe we, we think about sort of life sciences as the broader definition of bioinnovation, which is all technologies, governments, economies and collaboration brought to the fore to support um, issues of, of health so and biology. It's deep technology. Deep technology. Which could be advancing aerospace. Yeah. Advancing yeah. It'd be amazing what can come from other areas. I'll take a question from the floor if the are fun. You can steal some time back from coffee. And start to do that. Melanie, thank you. Thank you very much.